Well, I think we're going to kick off. Like we're about three minutes in. We got a 75 member audience going and counting. So yeah, um, everybody welcome to uh, this week's AMA. We're super excited, obviously nerding out already um, in our pre-banter. But um, as you can see, we've got a couple of special guests on stage this week. Um, this week is all about our Nyric early alpha test that we just launched on the Lamina One Hub this week. And we are joined by the team um, at Lovely Studio, who are the creators, developers, conceivers, conceptors of the game, um, as well as, uh, you know, Gordo and Will will be up on stage soon um, as the uh, L1 core team contingency. So yeah, um, as I said, we're kind of here to talk about the new space launch, um, kind of like what it is, uh, what we've been testing, what the integration is all about, as well as kind of diving deep with the Lovelace team into, you know, tips and tricks for early testing. Um, we're here to talk about, you know, some next steps for Nyric on Lamina 1. But yeah, it's definitely been a super fun week on the server. We see a ton of you are kind of in the game, uh, generating amazing looking AI landscapes um, and, you know, completing quests and all of that. So yeah, I'm super excited to dive in. And I think the first question that I'd love to kick off with uh, for the Nyric team is just, you know, give me like your elevator pitch or your description, like what is Nyric? Um, and like, why did you guys build it? Um, yeah, I'll take this one. Um... So uh, for those who played it, it, you might know or understand that it's a generative AI uh, kind of UGC world building platform. So UGC where you players are the ones that can give the prompts and explore this, the, the quests. Um, you know, it's it's uh, a bit of a basic uh, experience to start, but um, you can see how you know, you'll have more and more control over how you can build those worlds and how um, those quests can get more nuanced and, and more personalized over time. So um, we chose open world survival craft because it's very conducive to RPG sagas and experiences. Like you know, as we talked about Dungeons and Dragons, is definitely you know a target market that that we're trying to focus for early on. So um, uh, ultimately, our vision is to help cre uh, players create more epic stories, and that's that's kind of what the goal of the company is. And um, the reason uh, the ins the inspiration for it for for me is is um, like kind of many many lifelong gamers. It, actually helped me through a pretty hard point in my life. When I was uh, when I was 13 years old, I um, lost my mom after a long battle with cancer. And it was um, gaming uh, kind of was, was a beacon for me. It, it allowed me more meaning, kind of agency and purpose when the real world didn't, didn't have that much to offer and kind of realized that digital experiences could be just as powerful as real ones and wanted to, you know, build a system that, that could help more meaningful stories uh, versus those sort of the kind of short-term reward system, game experiences that people who have negative connotations with games associate it with. Yeah, and for me, I've, I've always just had a dream of building a world where you could replicate like the holodeck, right? A place where you could walk in and we were watching Next Generation, like 92, 93, thinking, well, how great would that be? And, you know, when Kayla and I first started working together, we said, maybe this is the time to actually do it. Maybe with the confluence of technology and the right systems, the right platforms, the right underlying technology, we could do that. We could finally do this. And we could finally deliver on the dream that we've all had, which is you say, okay, computer, I want to go over here and do this thing. I want to play in you know, Sherwood Forest. I want to walk along the rings of Saturn. I want to, you know, live inside the guts of a space worm. Like these are things that we might be interested in and want to do. And I think we're at a point where the technology might actually allow us to do it. So it's, it's pretty exciting for us. Amazing. Oh my God. I love that so much as a, you know, I think we were nerding out a little bit uh, before the AMA officially kicked off, but I also want to just dive in, like, tell me a little bit about the Lovelace team, like Kayla, Alex, like, do you guys want to introduce yourselves a little bit before we dive into the game? Like, who are you guys? Where do you guys come from? Like, how long have you guys been in development with uh, Nyric? Um, yeah, so, so last question, um, actually founded the company February, 2021. So it's about, uh, wow, three years old now and, um, was actually a VR kind of like a multiplayer combat VR game originally. Uh, 
my my background is um, is is more on like the engineering side. Uh, I I'm a former roboticist and AI uh, perception engineer, so working with uh, complex systems, actually in logistics warehouses, and um, using a lot of event driven data and uh, kind of runtime asynchronous information, and wanted to kind of format that and had like the inspiration essentially to format these kinds of like data driven pipeline systems into into games in a more complex way that that could kind of ultimately reach reach that kind of dream I was talking about earlier for me. Yeah, and I'm just I'm just a video game nerd. So, uh, you know, it, it seems natural to me. I've always been in the online game space. Uh, so my background is I, my very first game I worked on was EVE Online back in 2004. And then uh, from there, continued working in the MMO space. Like I said, worked on Tron's Call, Lord of the Rings, Dungeons and Dragons, worked on Game of Thrones game, Star Trek game, Walking Dead game, uh, worked on a bunch of side projects, did consulting in the, the Web3 space and NFT space and all that stuff. Um, but this is this is a core passion of mine. And not only that, it's it's where I've tried to make my expertise as a, prof- as a, like a professional in the space. And um, it always feels good to make something new, but it's like the hardest thing you could possibly do. So it's a, it's a chance for us to also just see what's possible out there. And I think every day we're just surprised as a team uh, at uh, mm-hmm. not only the reception that we get, but also what's now possible. And, and it's been, it's been a pretty wild time so far. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so some important context that I know we've kind of like, uh, with the announcement is like this test, this kind of like launch that we did on Lamina One is very much like an early alpha test. So kind of like what does early alpha mean and kind of like what stage are we at in Nyrix development? Like what can kind of folks expect with, with the this kind of like early play test experience? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll fill this one. Um, so the way that games typically are developed, right, is you guys may be, you know, familiar with a lot of the early access titles on Steam. Usually games go through a concept phase, right? And then they go through a pre-production phase. And a pre-production phase uh, happens typically when you say, like, well, what is this game going to be? And then after that, typically comes an alpha. And that's that's a prototyping phase. It's a time for us to identify core technology, you know, take a look at the core features that we're going to be building. So it's extremely early on in development. And most modern games take anywhere, call it from three to five years to develop. And we're about a, a year, year and a half in. So we anticipate, just given the amount of work that's left to be done, the alpha phase is going to be all about experimentation. And I think the next year in particular, you guys will see new features, new feature sets, new technologies come out. Um, and it's going to be all about experimentation, what works, what doesn't, and, and listening to what you guys have to say. And then after that comes the beta period, which is features that are ready to go in front of players, uh, usually a closed or open beta. And that's when you start saying, hey, this is a great opportunity for us to see how it really works in practice at scale. And then after beta would be, you know, full release. And of course, we're not going to stop supporting it then. (laughs) There's years and years and years after release. I mean, I was working on Asheron's call when, you know, we were in like years nine to 16 of its life. Uh, so to give you an idea, there's there's always a long life cycle behind um, online games like this. Awesome. Um, and we also, you know, we're joined by Will and Gordon, too, who have been kind of managing the sort of like hub integration side of this, right? So, you know, Lovelace and Nyrick, you guys are kind of some of the first people we've kind of put through our new sort of like onboarding process for, you know, space creators and kind of getting you guys up on the hub, which I know is like a, it was a pretty big kind of like learning and development process on our end too. So I think like Will and Gordon, can you guys just talk a little bit about just like what we've been kind of figuring out in the integration process and like, um, you know, also just some context and like, you know, why Lamina One was so excited about bringing uh, Lovelace and Nyrick onto the hub. I'm going to propose that perhaps I take the second part of that question initially, and then maybe Will, you can dive into um, more of the details. I think at a high level, it really reflects what's just been described. What we what we saw in Nyrick was a really exciting opportunity to um, for experimentation. As kind of um, an open world space, it gives us a lot of um, kind of uh, options in terms of how we might 
um, enable different types of content to be published on Lambda One and, and flow into the game, and also like vice versa, how to create content in the game and um, uh, and, and um, publish that onto the network. Um, so we think that it's a really broad canvas for experimentation, which is the most exciting thing uh, for us because it's going to really help us put uh, the platform in new, new and exciting ways. Um, and then, of course, like you said, like onboarding integration um, is really, really critical. Um, I think we're certainly going to be evolving um, kind of the experience around NARIC uh, within the Lamina One hub um, and, and how to kind of like keep um, people engaged and, um, and excited about what's happening kind of within the space and obviously aligned to the roadmap of, of NIRIC and, and the new features that are rolling out, et cetera. We think that there's going to be a lot more things that can be done both in the hub as well as in the game. And especially when we start thinking about things like multiplayer and, and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, Will, do you want to talk about more details? If your mic is working today. <laughs> okay, well, I'll answer that part of the question as well. well. We'll just drop. Yeah, I think, yeah, developer onboarding is really, really critical um, for us. And there's, there's a lot of um, kind of points of integration um, uh, with the platform uh, that, are, that, that are really critical. We've really kind of built out and done more work around documenting the APIs to support integration um, into the hub and support initial authentication as well as uh, the ability to create assets within within the experience. Uh, these assets are, um, you know, custom content assets based on your play of the experience. And so we're recording these world and these world items that get um, minted and, and and stored in your account on completing a quest. Uh, so you know the nature of that item is that it's very personal to your journey, um, and we think that it's a really interesting building block on which to then potentially create new types of content um, from, from your world NFT. So there's lots of concepts that we're working through right now and um, much discussion that we have with Amari team to talk about how we might um, kind of move forward in terms of enhanced features um, across the platform. So really, you know, technical documentation is key and, um, you know, we don't have a self-service way yet for uh, developers to launch spaces and applications on Lamina One, but we are building a lot of the infrastructure kind of the back end in the back end to support that to uh, with the goal to ultimately opening opening that up. And, and for a developer being able to integrate with authentication, get access to content, mint content um, is is really the nature of what that integration looks like. Awesome. Well, we're gonna dive into some uh, questions now, just about kind of like the game itself, right? Um, and I see that there's a bunch of people dropping questions in the chat. Gonna get to those um, at the end of the session. But yeah, if you have any questions for us, like while we're talking, feel free to drop them in the chat, and then we'll kind of get into them in like kind of the last ten to fifteen minutes of the session. So yeah, let's talk about Nyric itself. So I think one of the biggest questions and kind of like uh, theorizing we had on the server this week was just kind of around like, so obviously Nyric is using Gen AI, you kind of like, you know, for those who haven't played, you type in a prompt and it generates a world for you that you then sort of explore and quest in. And a lot of folks are kind of asking, you know, how exactly is the game parsing the prompts that uh, they're giving it? like? How does like the system kind of work on the back end? I feel like this will be super interesting. Um, yeah. So um, so when uh, we use Gen AI, Gen, Gen AI uh, particularly for the world building component, the generative, the procedural generation component, and the um, and the quest system. Uh, so uh, we're basically when players give a prompt, we break down that meaning um, using using kind of our own internal semantics and and um, categorical semantics of language model systems. So uh, OpenAI, and um, so it breaks down the world uh, for, from world components uh, not only into like biomes, climates, geologies, the objects in the space, but um, also like a thematic storyline that gets initialized and. Um, so, so it's kind of a combination of that sort of semantic matching and, and a growing, um, kind of adjacency database that we use to, to figure out the most relevant, uh, worlds, add some variety, uh, threshold, some, some space, some components. So, um, a lot kind of happens in the back end, but, but ultimately what you have 
is, um, you know, we're, uh, thematic world, you know, unique objects, skies, climates, and grass in the game experience. And then a unique quest, quest system that can progress your stories has an understanding of like unique loot, um, unique recipes that you can make in that world. And the, 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 the core game is meant to, you know, experience, let players experience just the, the base, like idea of all of that, um, kind of, uh, like holistically, and then, and then um, we are hoping to, yeah, you know, uh, with with this, you know, alpha alpha release, just wanted to see what people got most excited about, and what you know, what kind of worlds they wanted, and you know, help 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 players inform, you know, what what a generative like world building system that will ultimately will you know be a bunch of interoperable experiences is going to look like. So how is the game, like, where is the game pulling in these assets from? Like, what does that kind of, like, library look like? So obviously, you know, I can prompt, like, you know, fungal world or, like, interesting forest. Like, where where are those, like, assets coming from? Yeah, it's it's funny, right? Because when you see Gen AI in games, this is a question that comes up all the time. We talk to you know, partners, investors, fans, et cetera. And they all kind of assume that, you know, we're running out to some crazy algorithm and being like, yo, what's a mushroom? And then it's going to like return back a 3D asset and materials and all that stuff attached to it. But it's actually the opposite. Um, we have a really deep library of assets, only a few of which are exposed in this alpha. Um, and the idea behind it is that, no, Gen AI, Gen AI is actually fantastic at determining context. And so we use it, to Kayla's point, a lot in assessing the, like, what have you asked for? Uh, and that's one of the areas that we're continuing to push hard in. The assets come from a lot of our partner creators. The, some of them were made by ourselves, uh, by our team, by our designer. Um, and the library itself is is quite deep. In fact, the hardest thing is is just getting all the metadata around those assets so that it can be correctly pulled into the game itself. Um, so when you guys are saying, you know, like, hey, is this going to expand to future versions or seeing some of the cool prompts that you guys are asking for, it immediately makes us think, okay, well, there's just a lot of really interesting things in there that we can pull in already. Uh, now, you might be saying, okay, well, how do I how do I prompt a beautiful, cool, rich, <laughs> accurate, explorable world if you guys already have a whole bunch of these assets in there? And the answer is, right now, the best way is to to come in and pull pretty detailed prompts because we're going to come in and actually bring those assets. Uh, into there, and if we have matching assets, the more data that we have, the better we can match it to what you're asking for. So some people, when they're prompting, they're putting in like a single term. In fact, we've seen people put in nonsense terms or things have been misspelled. Um, one of those challenges is parsing that with like a similarity model and saying, well, okay, what do I think you were saying? One person wanted a steampunk world, but they called it a steam pank, P-A-N-K, W I R L. Um, so clearly, like that's not going to match anything. So you have to do some inference matching. But we do have steampunk assets. It's just that that person didn't quite get what they wanted because we need to continue improving the relevancy between the assets themselves. And that's where we're going to be spending a lot of our time. Yeah, that actually like is a super good lead into my next question, which is like, what are your guys' pro tips for prompting like beautiful, rich, accurate, and explorable worlds? Like, is there like a secret sauce that you guys have like discovered while like obviously doing a bunch of the building and testing of the game? I mean, I can I can make the platform do uh, a lot of things. The one thing I can't do is make it give me the exact same thing every time. So even I suffer from this sometimes. <laughs> same thing with the rest of the team is we were like, how do I get this world? The answer is like, I don't know. <laughs> it just depends on what comes up. But I would say there's try thinking about it in discrete areas uh, is one of the things that you can help with. Like separate them by commas, say something like I want X and then in Y and then in Z and split them up kind of into discrete thoughts and then shove that in and see what comes out. And it's going to have more data than the longer it is, it really does help generate relevant assets um, and it's going to give you something that's a lot closer to, to what you're looking for. So it is a case where being detailed is good. Of course, you could be over detailed. Um, and if you're over detailed, you might actually get too many. Uh, you might get what's called an overfit where there's too many assets that match what you're asking for. And then you just get a world that looks like it was thrown into a, a mixer and jumbled together. So there is there's sort of an expert uh, 
and level of detail you have to find there. I'm gonna let you guys figure it out, but um, but I would say maybe like two or three distinct thoughts chained together into a prompt. Awesome. Can you guys also tell us a little bit more about the quest system? So like we, we got a couple of questions like, are quests different depending on the world you're, you generated and, and how exactly are the quests themselves populated? Um, yeah, so the quests are different in, in the worlds you generated in that you'll be um, crafting, uh, you'll be collecting and crafting the unique loot and um, um, recipes in, that are thematic with that world. Uh, in addition, there's there's kind of unique descriptors of like if you were in um, like an ice world, it would be collect the um, collect the uh, frozen orbs to craft a uh, like fractal elixir to to increase your health or something. Um, but uh, addition, there's there's like some story, some backstory within each of those um, that that um, sometimes is confusing for players if it's like you know you need to go. Uh, fight the like the troll <laughs> when there's not when we don't yet have a troll for the system so the semantics with ai can be very finicky but um so there there's definitely a lot of diversity with how they're generated and some people find you know with the early stage as well that the quests the 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 quests you get don't explicitly give you a lot of detailed information or are lacking in in that flavor um and that's just the iterative process of of getting the ai to be consistent with its responses um so some so we try to parse all of the edge cases, but uh, sometimes some a few slip through the cracks. Um, and the the initial crafting uh, system that that kind of core like mini objective is uh, one of a few different subtypes we have with our objective system. So you can discover, you can um, you can build, and um, um, you can like talk to the AI and kind of like achieve uh, sort of like like a fetch, uh, like a goal fetch or a, a like um, achievement fetch. And we're just trying to grow that out. So like the different subtypes of quests that you can do, um, similar to like role-playing games where you have these, like what is a, like what is a mission? It's 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 essentially a series of, of sub-quests that, that a player has to execute. And so we started with the craft system because uh, the crafting quest, because it's one of the harder ones, there's, there's more parameters involved, um, whereas the other ones can be broken down a bit more atomically. And so... You can expect a lot more to grow with with um, with the quests, and and we'll give players more control on how that how the quest system evolves because you know the story builders like they're they're in control of the story as well, and we want to give them that kind of expose those elements to them more in the future. Do you guys have any tips for users who are having difficulty with questing in the early alpha? So you know this is obviously super early play testing, but we've had a number of questions around like you know how can I find the quest spot it's telling me to locate? Like what's going on with this? Like I I'd love to hear from you guys. Like obviously we're like testing and the quest system isn't like super perfect, but do you guys have any tips for like you know getting through it or, or kind of finding the Feybot or or any sort of insider tips like that? Um, I think tip number one is that we have not implemented anything yet to get a Feybot from under a mountain. So be aware, the poor Feybot may be stuck underneath an asset, um, and that can happen. I know, yeah, it's... someone was like, the Feybot is at the bottom of an ocean. I was like, oh yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's sometimes, you know, the way things are layered into the map, the way things are spawned, you may, you may find that the Feybot is stuck somewhere. Now, the good news is that you can bash things. Uh, and try to get it out of the way. Um, but the bad news is that it might have like 7,000 health and you sit there for 10 minutes just trying to break down a mountain only to find out that there's another mountain underneath it that's still squashing it. You can always create a new world. Um, that'll that'll reset the Feybot location and allow you to try again. Um, and then remember, I would say, remember the AI lies. Uh, it, well, it's not that it lies so much, it just gets really excited about giving you a quest. I think Kayla can talk a little bit more about that, but when it gets really excited, sometimes it says things that don't exist. Just remember that it's always gonna ask you to break down assets to pick up a glowy loot object. That's that's really what it's trying to tell you. It just gets really excited that you might actually find a troll out there somewhere. Also got a question from our users, um, you know, what's the deal with the XP system? So obviously, um, when you 
find your when you complete your quests and you generate your unique world item, you get an NFT that uh, comes into your Lamina One Hub. And a lot of people have been kind of like looking into that metadata, seeing what it says. And we've got some eagle eyes that are noticing that certain worlds are generating more XP than others in the metadata. So like, what's the deal with this? Is this gonna be more important in future builds? Is this hinting at future functionalities to come? Yeah, I mean, it's really gonna mess with you guys. Is when you realize that we're, you've actually got like 40 plus stats attached to your characters and just don't know about it. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things we're going to be tracking right now. XP isn't doing anything uh, meaningful, but you can expect in the future um, that there's lots of data that's going to be attached to it. I don't think it, you don't need to be super, um, you don't need to go super far to think immediately, hey, like if we can attach some metadata to your character and attach metadata to your worlds, Maybe that means there'll be interoperability in the future, multiplayer in the future, something that will allow us to compare and contrast our players in our characters against other players and characters. And I think that uh, don't worry about it. If you get one number versus the other, it's not the end of the world, but it's just consider it a little hint of the future and what the future could hold um, and uh, and let your mind go a little, uh, be a little imaginative and think about what interoperable worlds could mean to you. Super exciting. I think um, the ability to like the, the kind of stats integration is, I think, super exciting. Um, another big question we've received over and over again on the server this week is any ETA for Mac users? So, yeah, right now, Nyric is only accessible to uh, people with PC running Windows. But, um, you know, I think a lot more people want to play it if you when you guys are ready. Yes, we are working on that. Um, currently, we, we're also working with some partners, some 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 real um, vetted deployment experts in the space uh, for for Unreal to to get that set up. Um, definitely understand that's you know we want to we're really trying to make it as accessible as possible, uh, but also wanted to get these early, this early testing. So appreciate everybody's patience with that. Um, we'll we'll definitely stay noisy once um, once once that uh, that's in the horizon. But but currently working on it now. Yes. Another big question, too, is uh, why is the game so heavy? So we've got a bunch of sort of guesses among testers um, that the game's like feels like it's maybe in the pre-optimization stage. Um, you do need a pretty sophisticated machine right now to play it. So, um, you know, would love to kind of hear your guys uh, answer to that. I think Kayla can speak a little bit to it as well. Um... Uh, but I, I can't speak to it as much other than saying, because a lot of it's, you know, internal testing and optimization work that we still have to do. But there's a lot of technology that we're utilizing that we have to take advantage of in order to support what you guys can create. So if you think about it, a lot of games, one of the ways they save on performance is they pre-compute lighting locations and shadows. So like you can't move a piece of furniture because if you moved it the shadow would stay where it was and that was one of those tips and tricks we used back in the 90s and 2000s to save on performance we can't do that we can't assume that anything is going to be anywhere so it means we have to use dynamic lighting it means we have to do some clever tricks to try to prevent um try to prevent issues where lighting and shadows don't match up correctly and a lot of that tech is still being prototyped and hashed out uh, we're using the unreal 5 engine and there's a lot of the optimization work that still needs to happen there. And um, we expect it will get better. But yeah, if it seems unoptimized, it's because it is. I also want to dive into just kind of like what you guys have been kind of learning from the community in this first week of testing. So obviously, we're about seven days into testing Nyric on Lamina 1. We dropped it first to our sort of smaller top testers group and then open it up to the whole community at the start of this week. But what are sort of some of the biggest inputs, bugs, or points of feedback that you guys are kind of thinking about or working on um, after the release? Um, yeah, for, for the bug side, um, it's kind of two, two main areas. It's like the system capabilities, the functionality mentioned a bit for the Mac users, but also yeah, um, it, it being a high kind of a High performance game that requires um, get more, more modern uh, some some modern compute. Um, so we're working on 
uh, expanding, you know, that we're, we're um, optimizing for, for people who may want more low poly worlds. If, if uh, uh, FPS is a bit, um, if FPS is a bit high. And um, so that was, that was good to see like how, you know, what, what the pain points were for a lot of folks. Uh, also, you know, we want uh, being able to, to incorporate some installer at some point would be really great. We know it's, it's um, it can be a bit painful to have to unzip the file, locate it, you know, go through wi um, the, the window security uh, challenge, which is uh, kind of a big problem actually, and a big, big hard problem to fix, I should say. And then um, you have to be able to finally download the game. So, so we know that that's not, you know, the experience, it's not uh, a steam like in that regard. And we want to make that easier for folks for sure. Just reduce all the, all the barriers just to, to get into playing. Um, and then on the game side, uh, have seen some some hallucinations on on the quests uh like i mentioned that sort of troll like we don't have a troll yet and just trying to be more explicit that you know this is a collect and craft initially um but uh when we have a new release there's going to be you know a lot more diversity and a lot more elements and the game people will hopefully be able to interact with so uh, i think um that's that will hopefully be better and then yeah just the the world some occasional world inaccuracies or um yeah elements um that that don't always match your prompt which um, again, also working on for, for future release and great feedback as well from everybody. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it. it. Yeah. I mean, you guys, all of our testers, again, are, you guys are just superstars. I think like we're super excited to be able to kind of bring your guys power that you guys have had in helping us build out the hub and start opening it up to, you know, our space builders and stuff. So yeah, definitely expect more fun stuff like this moving forward. Um, I think another big question that I've been fielding or kind of uh, listening to on the on the server is just kind of like, when can Nyric Early Access or Lamina 1 beta testers kind of expect the next update? Like, you guys kind of mentioned with the uh, that XP system question, some new features or updates or play modes that could be on the horizon. So I'd love to get a sneak peek from you guys here, um, what you guys are thinking about. Yeah, I mean, we're it, we're so early in development and we're so deep in development that it can be challenging for us to whip out our crystal balls and see what the future is going to bring. Um, but I think there's a few things that you guys can expect. And the, the first is we're definitely parsing all the feedback in our own internal data. Uh, and it's going to take a little bit of time for us to integrate all of that. And we have our own roadmap, but I think we could break it down into kind of three main buckets, right? Like one is just increasing the relevancy of what you guys are seeing and, you know, call that the world relevancy and asset relevancy as well as the quests. So continuing to work on that to make the quest system, you know, smarter and, and integrate what's actually in the world, make the worlds reflect what you're intending um, much more often. The second thing is building out a lot of those core survival craft features. So some of you have been uh, curious enough to unlock some of the build systems and craft systems and take a look at what's in there. Take a look at the inventory. Uh, if you've really tried, you might notice that you can consume items in your inventory and that that actually modifies things like food and water, although it doesn't do anything when you run down to zero in this early access build. But continuing to build out some of those core survival craft features that we all know and love from games like Valheim or Rust or, um, or even Power World. And then the last thing is that multiplayer and interoperability. So those are sort of the three areas that we're working on. So there's that persistence layer, which is part of the multiplayer and, and single player side where we want to persist those worlds, make sure you guys can save it, make sure your changes to them are saved. And then if you want to regenerate it, you know, you can create sort of separate worlds. The second one, those core gameplay mechanics that we all know and love. And the third is just increasing the relevance of what you've been asking for and, and what we can deliver. And then in terms of update cadence, we're really going to, you know, have to take a look at that. But I would say, you know, expect a new build at least every month or two for now. Um, but I would expect those updates to be very significant. They'll probably contain, you know, new features. They might remove existing features. They might change uh, features entirely because we are still in such an early deep stage of development. Nothing is really sacred in the build. So expect change. And a pretty significant change, but a lot of that change to be limited to kind of those three areas. 
Awesome. Super excited about that. I mean, I, we're ready to test it whenever you guys are. Um, so I think like, obviously, you know, the feedback, all of the inputs from the community have been super important. So Lovelace team, what's the best way or place for folks to be giving you their thoughts, ideas, uh, feedback on the game as we move forward in early alpha testing? Discord Discord's always great. Um, yeah, uh, we, we try to stay active in the channel um, and we'll be bringing on some folks to help as well with, um, with you know, staying, staying um, quick on our feedback uh, to, to help folks out who are trying to play it. Um, so Discord channel's fantastic. That's gonna be where you're gonna see all the updates and, and all the, the, the kind of core um, discourse. And then on our Twitter as well, um, we're growing that out. So I'd say those are the main two. Um, and any like more direct uh, uh, content, content, or if you wanna reach out, you can email support at lovelacestudio.com. And we can, we can also happy to talk with folks uh, who, who are really interested as well. Awesome. And what are the sort of main feedback or points of, or inputs that you guys are specifically looking for in early alpha? Like what's super helpful to you guys right now? Uh, honestly, create as many worlds as you can. So one of the things that's invaluable to us is you guys should just come in and really tell us what you want to see. And then come in and show us through your screenshots what was delivered and then tell us uh, what it should have looked like. So this is one of those things that's invaluable and impossible for us to get just through our own brains because we're just not as creative as all of you put together. Those of you coming in and saying, hey, I, I wanted this and I got this and this is what I intended is invaluable to us. Every one of you that comes in and posts that kind of feedback uh, every world that you try to do, then go ahead and let us know how it went. And that's going to help us the most out of everything. Um, it's really, really helpful to see what you guys are posting and how it's working and, and what you were able to get. So I think that's that's number one for me. Kayla, what do you what do you think? What else are we well, looking for? Yeah, um, so definitely not trying to like bucket everybody into the same category, but uh, generally if you're with Lambda 1, you're probably um, probably technophiles interested in like the ble most bleeding edge tech out there probably science fiction fans and and interested in, in, in crypto. So, um, you know, you, you all have very unique ex perspectives. You're um, looking at, you're very future facing. And so your inputs um, with this, with a generative system that, that helps you build stories is like you, you're the folks, you know, we want to, we, we care most about and trying to get, you know, the, that, that really um, kind of area, like coming from a, the, the the perspective of, of your expertise i think in like game design systems like compare and contrast what you've experienced before um and particularly like with that lens of story building would love to see what your inspirations are and what what really resonates like what did you care what do you care about most what do you actually not care about so much as well as actually really important so so yeah um and and yeah keep keep being you know straightforward we brusque we uh you know <laughs> don't beat around the bush we, we we just want that you know that candid that candid feedback Amazing. Um, gonna, and I've got one more. Oh yeah, go ahead. Alex, you're you not going to hurt. You're not going to hurt our feelings by saying something was incorrect. You know, we would very much prefer you guys come in and say this didn't miss the mark, or and but also tell us where it did hit the mark. Um, that's going to be super valuable to us. To Kayla's point. Awesome. Um, I've definitely got a couple of questions from the Q and A. Um, I've got one more question actually to open it back up to uh, Will and Gordon. So. Obviously, Nyric has been super fun and really exciting. And I think like, you know, um, a lot of people are hungry for more sort of metaverse experiences or spaces or ways to kind of get involved and start, you know, creating on Lamina One. So Gordon Will, like what's kind of next uh, for kind of both like spaces and things like this um, on the horizon? Um, we've got a couple of questions, you know, even in the chat today asking about kind of like roadmap or, um, what we can expect next. I uh, would love a little preview on that from you guys. Will, do you want to take this one? You missed the last one, so. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, can you so, guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just want to give you a chance cool. to say a few words. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah, so um, for one thing, we've, we've really been expanding the notion of the space internally um, away from what we were kind of originally 
perceiving as just like a sort of external application or experience and sort of targeting it more towards being a uh, sort of like a creator and fan community focused on like a specific IP. And so while that external app, such as like the love, uh, the Nyric game or the space laser game is definitely a part of what we envision um, a space being, we're also talking about, um, you know, sort of creating an environment within the hub that really enriches the ways that fans can engage and co-create with their favorite content creators. Um, so we'll talk, I think, a little bit more about that in the future. But um, yeah, that that's one aspect of it is we're, we're sort of just expanding what a space is and what it means to be more than just an external application, but more of a co-creation environment that has both an external application component, but also within the hub, a sort of community component to it. Um, I don't know if we're really, I, I don't know that we have any public timelines we can share on specific space integrations just yet. Um, but once we build out some of these new features in the hub and we incorporate some of the learnings and feedback that um, we've been gathering from this collaboration with Lovelace, uh, we'll definitely be looking at facilitating user-generated spaces soon after. Um, Gordon, I don't know if you had anything you want to add. No, I think that's great. Yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there, and um, <clears throat> certainly as we're you know thinking about our path to mainnet as well, um, you know we certainly want to be able to support um, lots of different types of spaces being created on on the platform and different ways of interacting, um, uh, kind of in the in the community and, and amongst the community of people that are. Using these app, you know, spaces and applications, and, and working together to build interesting things. So yeah, lots more to come over the year. Actually, um, there's, there's a lot of work for us to do. Awesome. Uh, kind of speaking of co-creation, we got a really good question from um, Jackal Girl in the chat, who's who asked um, if we're like learning to build assets or textures. Is there any way that we can like help contribute to? The library of Nyric assets, or like start contributing to to helping out to like build the game. Is that something that you guys have like thought about, or is that something that we would be interested in? That's a that's a cool suggestion. So uh, like a community, like uh, crowdsourced assets and resources would be would be awesome. Um, especially if um, depending on you know. With, with the creator spaces when we get more like 3d objects and potentially even 3d like animated objects uh one of the one of our future uh uh developments is going to be on on runtime asset imports which we we have we have to some capabilities um but we we want to be able to you know from from a game at runtime bring in an asset that wasn't that wasn't already built into the into the into the system so um yes that would be super cool uh would love to if, any, if anybody's interested in that, we'd, we'd love to talk with you because, yeah, we, you know, if we're building worlds and generating spaces, it just, it, they can go pretty broad in terms of the asset sets that you require. Yeah, I think one of the things, one of the challenges there is the licensing and rights. And, you know, we see this a lot in generative AI spaces. Um, usually when you work with a partner, a creative partner, you set up a contract and, you know, whether that's a consultancy agreement or a work for hire agreement. Um, or if you have a library of existing assets, you license access to those assets. Um, User-generated content is something that you just have to be a little careful with because you want to make sure that every t anything that's created in the world, you as a company have, have the rights to using it. Um, so it's something that we just need to double check on there as well. But yeah, I think both of us are so excited about the idea of players being able to contribute and really making these worlds unique. In fact, if you go back to some of our very earliest conversations when Kayla and I are, you know, grabbing coffee together right before we started really working together on this project. That was one of the core tenets that we looked at was like, man, what if we were actually able to allow people to allow our players to put their own unique content into the game? Wouldn't that be amazing if I was able to log into a world and see this person's unique creation? That was unique to their world. Wouldn't that be something awesome? And I think it's closer than we think. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, and we definitely have some tools, you know, if people are reading and looking closely at our kind of template architecture, I will say like Lamina One is even, we're, we're very much trying to build out this infrastructure. So yeah, Lovelace team, I mean, we're going to be collaborating long term, but we should definitely uh, chat about this. Um, Erasmus also has a really interesting question that I wanted to field by you guys, which asks, um, how do you guys envision like potential interconnection of user worlds. So they say, you know, I have a set of native assets in my world. Do you think there would be some kind of reason for like other people to visit my world to get some of these resources or like any sort of like those dynamics that you guys have been thinking about? Oh yeah, Alex, Alex and I can go, can go pretty deep into this one. Do you want to go first or? Sure, I, I, I mean, this is, this is like, you guys, this is amazing. The, the concept behind that, the I like it, it takes approximately 0.2 seconds to think about like how user worlds could be interconnected. The idea of us being able to swap assets between worlds, the idea of you guys being able to create things and then visit each other's worlds. I, you know, the very first game I ever worked on was one of the most hyper focused PvP competitive games that we've ever built uh, as an industry. And, you know, there was nothing, and, and I am a PvPer, so that's, you know, one of our character archetypes that we talk about. Uh, I love building pretty things in games, and then I love smashing down other people's pretty things. And so the idea of those player-focused communications, connections, is like at the heart of a lot of our long-term roadmap and gets, you know, Kayla and I really excited. Yeah, um, and kind of like give give... A, a bit more of um, like some some imagery into what you know what what, what we're planning in in regards to this. So um, multiplayer is 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 absolutely on the roadmap as Alex mentioned. Like that's a definite, and that's going to um, organically drive so many unique uh, like how the story is going to grow. Um, we're like if you could imagine like with a steampunk world next to a like sort of feudal Japan space, and how each world has stories, but um, it's us, there's many stories within each world as they overlap and interconnect with one another. So you have these like anachronistic like events that that are driven by the players in in the world, and the players have these different um, you know can have roles in these systems as creators, as leaders, as coordinators, as merchants, or as renegades or outlaws. You know, there's so so once that multiplayer system comes into play, and then we we figure out how interoperability, like how the the game the system's interoperability is going to be competitively balanced. I think um, it's going to be really quite exciting, and that's going to—that's truly the heart of of how we want to to envision this, and how you know we see it as um, kind of that 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 metaverse experience. Yeah, and I think we were really inspired by our experiences playing like World of Warcraft. You go into like Orgrimmar, and you would run around the auction house, and then people would be wearing all this wild armor and have all these different character types, and it becomes this like very metropolitan scene. And the idea of us having like a hub world in the future where you guys can come with all the stuff that you've discovered across all the worlds and like you come into this multiversal marketplace, right? And people are selling and hawking their wares. Hey, I've got this like mithril ore that I discovered on this fantasy world. And someone's like, dude, I've got a bunch of cyberpunk circuits. Like, let's smash that together and see what happens. Um, and it's like, yeah, that's, that sounds great. You know, what? how cool would it be to see a goblin in, you know, like mystical armor haggling with like a futuristic robot and knowing that they all have their own stories and their own backgrounds that they've created in their own worlds and that you could go participate in those worlds yourselves would be really, really compelling. Now that can't happen unless we get hundreds of thousands of people playing the game. So, you know, there's that little hurdle. Uh, plus we've got to build all of it, you know, just got to build all the, all the things. Um, but that's certainly like part of the the heart of our vision is like, how do we enable experiences like that? Yes, yeah, super fascinating. Oh, man. All right. I have one more question from the chat before uh, we sign off. And this is like, you know, with the with the uh, end of Q&A questions, we don't get as much of a nice story flow. But this one's a pretty uh, tactical one. And this one's for either you, Will, or Gordon. But um. Ed Keys is asking about the uh, hub login code thing. So, you know, the way that you get into Nyric, you know, you have to authenticate using this little code. So is that kind of intended as a standard spaces integration method for Lamina One? Like, 
how does that part of it work? Uh, just to really deeply nerd out for a second, just on like the hub side integration aspect. Yeah, so I don't know that I would call it a standard just yet. It is certainly um, something, it's not like a one-time off um, approach, but it's not necessarily the final solution either. Um, the way it works is uh, when you want to jump into a space, um, your hub wallet account will sign a message which grants that space limited read-only privileges to your user profile and item inventory. And then it sends that signed message to our backend, which will then authenticate it against the public key in your wallet. And if that's valid, it'll generate this one-time use code, which you've been using. Um, and that one-time use code has a pretty short time to live. Um, now, when you enter that code into an external application, um, it can then use it to communicate with that same backend to both read items from your user um, inventory or your profile information about you from your profile, um, but it can also be used uh, as you've seen with Nyric um, and with the Space Lasers uh, arcade game. It, it can also be used to mint and deliver new items to your inventory. Um, so there are ways to automate this so that you're not kind of using a, a manual one-time use code, but given the stage that we're at and some of the uh, the stage that some of the projects we're working on are at, this is like a good for now strategy that's relatively easy for um, like the, the applications themselves to implement. It doesn't require deep integrations. So I hope that answers the question. Totally, yeah. And if you guys have any kind of feedback on that onboarding flow in general, so we've been this week, we've been kind of focused on saying like, you know, if you have feedback about the game itself, like definitely go to the Nyric team directly with that, because, um, you know, they're the ones who are going to be kind of going through that. But if you have any feedback on that, like onboarding integration flow or any like better ideas, I'm just going to drop our block survey link, um, that onboarding process. Like we are always accepting feedback on that um, and would love your ideas and stuff. As you guys know, we're listening super deeply to everything you guys are saying and um, super helpful stuff. Um, that is kind of the last of our uh, questions. So as I'm signing off here, I'm going to plug in the uh, secret code for listening into today's AMA. You can uh, use that to redeem on Zeely. Um, you know, as you guys know, we're continuing to quest until mainnet launch. So um, just drop that in the channel now. So, I mean, thank you so much, Lovelace team. This was super fascinating. Um, I know we've been working together for a, a couple of months now, but I learned even so much about it. This is fantastic. So I think, you know, our main CTAs today are, you know, join the Lovelace Discord, um, you know, show them some love. I popped that link up earlier in the chat. Um, you know, start testing or continue testing, you know, leave feedback, you know, in the right place. And I think, you know, in general, if you're having fun, like keep experimenting to see what you can build, right? Like you don't just have to generate one world, complete the quests and then like kind of, you know, wipe your hands off and say you're done like the more like you kind of play like try to break the system try to build crazy things like um i think this will be super exciting and i i also um i know lovelace team you wanted me to put in a, a plug um the lovelace team will be at gdc this year in san francisco coming up soon so uh if anyone else in the l1 community will be at gdc you can uh talk to them there and ask them even more questions about the experience. So definitely uh, hit them up and let us know if you'll be at GDC this year. Um, on the Lamina One side, you know, obviously stay tuned. Uh, Will and Gordon hinted at some really exciting kind of evolutions we have planned for the evolution of what spaces are going to be on Lamina One. Um, we're also going to be launching profiles pretty soon um, on Lamina One where you can kind of like a place that's like a little bit more than just like your Lamina One hub address. Um, and also, you know, more updates to the Creator Studio, uh, as well as, you know, future updates and additions to the Nyric space on Lamina One. So, you know, as always, we're super happy to have you all on this journey with us. Uh, we're super excited to be getting more spaces and more fun things to do on Lamina One. And um, right now is a super exciting time for us. Um, 
you know, it really does feel like, especially having the Lovelace team on that, like this open metaverse that we've been like building slowly bit by bit over the last year is really starting to come to come to life. And I mean, it's been so much fun. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And um, we'll see you guys on the channels. Awesome. Thank you so much, Casey. Thank you. Right. Team in Bye. general. Blast work. So much, everyone. See ya. <laughs> Take care. Bye, everyone.